that it's important that they understand whatever that bug is, whatever the next activity is, they want to know, is this activity going to be considered passive income or is it considered ordinary income? Because based on those two distinctions, you want a little bit of a different approach. And these guys aren't reading 77,000 pages of tax code. I'm not doing anything necessarily to lobby laws. We love those people who do that because, you know, we'll just benefit from the laws that help them, but also will help us. So there's certain expenses that already exist in your life that now that you're a business owner, we can just tweak it slightly and change your intention, like document your intention a little bit differently. And now they become tax write-offs. And if I'm an investor and I have this entity, I can take advantage of that same tax rule. On a base level, the tax code addresses people who make different types of income. It's 77,000-ish pages, so light reading, you know. Half fall under ordinary income, half. So there's this rule that makes a rest, like a real estate property, a real estate property. And that's this. Hi, Julie Tallman here. I'm with Christian Sadler. Hey everybody. And we would like to welcome you to the Fundication Show. Today we have an industry expert in the world of real estate tax, and we're gonna speak to him in regards to sheltering income and all the other things that we need to know about that we don't know. John Briggs, welcome from Insight Tax. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. You're the founder of Insight Tax. And before we dig in, find, a little, find out a little bit more about your story and how you got started and your team and then get to the good stuff, um, I think I'd like to have Christian just tell you a little bit about what we do so that we have some good context. Okay. Yeah, John, thank you for coming to the studio, by the way. It's always good to have professionals in here to give some guidance to the audience. And uh, pre I share, really what we're doing is we're creating a secondary marketplace for fractional shares in real estate syndications. So essentially the passive investor, we wanna offer them liquidity. And we also have a $100 million fund that we are uh, doing our raise for that we will buy those fractional shares to create instant liquidity. And so we want to have more transparency and more liquidity in the world of real estate syndications. So with that said, tell us a little bit about what, what, how did you get into tax accountancy? Oh man, um, I had a mentor in my life when I was in my 20s. And I had, I basically, he knew me well enough, I just asked him, what do you think I should do? Because my previous decision in life was I thought I wanted to play video games my whole life. But it turns out when you go and get that degree, they never assigned video game playing as a single assignment. Like this is, this is baloney. <laughs> so he said, you know, I think you would be good with something like business or law. It just so happens that both of those paths take me, take you through an accounting program. And it's the first subject that actually clicked in my mind. Like I was a good student, but I had to work really hard at it. It's just the first time, which it does mean that I'm weird. Yes, debits, credits, all the weird accounting stuff. It just, it made sense to my weird little mind. Um, and then from there, you get into some experiences where you start reflecting and um, as a child, I was bullied on my street for just being a little bit different than everyone else. And, um, you know, I just kind of had poor things that like related to being bullied. In the tax world, you have the IRS, which happens to be the largest, like structured government enforced bully. Um, they often will send letters and things and taxpayers don't know any better. They just do what they, the IRS is telling them to do. And in our experience, you know, 85% of the time, the IRS is wrong. So those kind of things got me into accounting, which then led me to tax. And we, you know, our firm really enjoy helping protect the taxpayer against the bullying nature of the IRS. And then, of course, helping them keep as much money in their pocket as possible. How big is your team? About 70 right now. Wow. You've grown. Yes. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot to do in, in this world. Let's talk about real estate investing and why that is so beneficial for sheltering people's incomes. Um, on a base level, the tax code addresses people who make different types of income. It's 77,000-ish pages, so light reading, you know. If you guys ever want a copy, I can send you one. Um, 
very few, very little of that applies to people who make W-2 income. It's very black and white for them. Once I become a real estate investor at any level, even a passive investor in a syndicate, I now, by definition of the tax code, I'm a business owner. And now the whole 77,000 pages are open to me. I'm not doing anything necessarily to lobby laws. We love those people who do that because, you know, we'll just benefit from the laws that help them, but also will help us. So um, the, the first reason is to consider you get a lot more tax flexibility on the way you can lower your income as a real estate investor. Now, what is that first advice, if you will, or guidance you would give somebody if they have been taught to go to school, get good grades, get a good job, and then they realize that they're losing, you know, 30 to 50% of their income to the government and they're wanting to reduce that. What are some of the first things that you suggest that they do? So specifically with real estate investors, we want to look at what's the entity structuring. So in these syndicates, a lot of times they're getting K-1s. Um, so just a W, if I'm an employee, I get a W-2. If I'm an independent contractor, I get a 1099. If I'm a business owner, I get a K-1. So this K-1 then, you know, if it's issued in my personal name to my social security number, that's okay. Um, but better to have it issued to an entity that now I'm going to use for all my real estate investing. So now I have an actual business. Um, that's step one. And then within that, we help the person realize all the things you're already doing, paying for your cell phone, all internet, traveling. There are certain expenses that already exist in your life that now that you're a business owner, we can just tweak it slightly and change your intention, like document your intention a little bit differently. And now they become tax write-offs. Yeah, that's huge. And can you just maybe go through a, a short list of some of those, you know, uh, tax write-offs that people are already paying for that they're not thinking about necessarily? Yeah, so cell phone, as a real estate investor, you need to be reachable at all times, because uh, we know Crazy things can happen, like a fire in Maui. Um, you are also going to need internet to research possible deals. Like you just can't do anything with the internet. So cell phone, internet, driving around. If I can have a business purpose to just the miles that I'm driving, anywhere I go as a real estate investor, if there's land, they didn't have to have a property yet. There's land and that's a possible business purpose. Could be driving around, specifically looking for a new location, the, the gym or, the, oh, this looks like a residential area, whatever. The sky's the limit on how to come up with business purpose to your miles. And then travel is a really great one. Uh, we can go into a lot of details if you want on the specifics of travel, but everyone's traveling. And as I mentioned, as long as there's land where you're going, you have a chance to write that off. So you might as well take advantage of those things. So those are the lowest fruits. Yeah, that makes sense. And I'd love to go over, there's a lot of people out there that they know they want to be in real estate. They know they probably should be in real estate. I mean, the higher returns and the tax benefits, um, but they're busy professionals. And so what are some of the ways that you've seen people be able to invest passively in real estate and still get some of these tax benefits? Yeah, let me start with what I've seen hasn't worked. That's a great idea. Right? Um, busy professionals, they see the shows on TV. Uh, and of course, you actually can't verify if the numbers they're sharing on the TV episode are accurate. And a lot of times, the numbers they do share are withholding some information, um, especially as you're a real estate investor and you're looking at it, you're like, okay, they didn't mention closing costs, they didn't mention carrying costs. Anyways, if you're a busy professional, buying a property to flip it, uh, probably not a great idea. They just, they don't end up having the time until the project falls flat. They don't get a fast enough turnaround. Usually they borrowed money. So now the profit they would have made all went to interest expense. Also short-term rentals, really hot topic right now. Everyone thinks that everyone who has a short-term rental is be gonna become a millionaire. And it's possible, right? Every, all these avenues are great for certain people. But you gotta be honest with yourself. Short-term rental, like, yeah, you could have a management company and that makes it passive, but then you're giving up a decent chunk. 
So now you need more short-term rentals to maybe get the income you want. So we found syndicate deals are amazing for the busy professional because that's what the syndication does. They take all the headache off your plate. They do all the research. They come through the thousands of deals to find the one that makes the most sense. Um, I, I personally am invested in one in Arizona right now. and I love it. I hadn't, didn't have to do anything other than give them my money. And they did all this research. They give us this monthly update. We have these, these tenants are leaving. This is what our current occupancy rate is. We're renovating this percentage by this date. It'll, it's like, those are all logical things that anyone would do. But if I'm a busy professional, I don't have the time to do that. So just, you get the update. Um, and that's all I need. As a passive investor, that alone makes me a real estate, not the status of real estate professional, but I'm a business owner in the real estate world according to tax code. And that that's really what helps them. Yeah. In, in regards to somebody who starts investing, is a passive investor, never has before, what type of percentage change can they see in their taxation? It really depends, it varies. It depends on their kind of lifestyle, right? If, if I'm a busy professional and maybe I'm making $500,000 a year, I'm probably gonna have some a lot more expenses than the busy professional was making hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, regardless, it does go down. It's always a percentage of savings, and honestly, even one percent you keep in your pocket instead of giving it to the government to waste on entitlement programs that do you no good. It, the world's a better place for that. Agreed. <laughs> well, and especially when you're doing it with something that also makes you more money, right? Right. Yeah, it's like double dipping. I save money over here on taxes. My money's not working for me over here and I'm not actually doing anything. Like it's kind of a good deal. Our CEO, Mike Anderson said something the other week when we were talking about people investing in our fund. And he literally said, look, it's kind of easy. It's like selling money at 70%. Um, and I thought it really is because by the time it comes back around, you've done so well. So that's one thing. That's one reason we're so passionate about having investors work with real estate sponsors that know what they're doing. Yeah, well, and I think a lot of people don't even realize the true passive nature of investing into a real estate syndication. In fact, I've met professionals that have spent their entire career trying to figure it out and going in, in a lot of those wrong ways, right? The things that take them away from their business, take them away from their family on their off times and they're trying to figure out how do I get invested in real estate and when I started in real estate myself I learned a lot by watching other deals happen right and with investing in real estate syndication you get the opportunity to watch good operators operate the type of properties that maybe you would want to uh, own yourself in your later years uh, but you get to do it and and earn that income along the way without having any of that liability that you need to fly out because there was a fire or you know get the calls from the tenants or from the managers a lot of people think you know the more layers i can put in place the more I can become passive, but you're usually always managing something, even if it's managing the managers, unless you're invested passively. Yeah, that's a great point. A lot of times in our world, we get the initial question of like, how do I save taxes? And don't get me wrong, we want everyone to pay the least amount possible. But the reality is it it is about growing your wealth. Like, let us help you. Our expertise is we'll help you save taxes so you now have more money left over so that you can do things with it like growing your wealth because saving taxes for the sake of saving taxes doesn't do you any good if you're not doing anything with that extra money. And by witnessing how a more experienced team is doing it, that at least gives you a better opportunity that, like you mentioned later in your life, it's like, you know what, I think I'm ready to do my own 10 door apartment complex because I've seen 1700 deals with the syndication that I'm a part of. Yeah. What types of things do real estate syndicators need to know about taxation or tax law that maybe you see they, they don't know? Is there, is there anything that comes to mind with that? Um, I mean, I'll mention a few things, but in my experience, the syndications that we've been involved with and know of, these are really experienced top shelf yeah they're great guys uh and women <laughs> um 
But yeah. you know, you want to make sure that the syndication understands cost segregation, for example, because yeah. that tax benefit passes on to you as the passive investor, which is great. As the passive investor, you don't even need to know what it is because they're just going to do it for you. Um, but the way that works, in my, one of my accounting professors, like if you want to understand a tax term, just say it slower <laughs> or backwards. It's the segregation of costs. So in the tax world, if I buy a property, um, residential real estate is depreciated, meaning I can take a deduction over the amount of years the IRS tells me I can take it for that price. Uh, in this case, residential real estate's 27 and a half years. Commercial properties are 39. 39. 39. Holy cow. I think long it. hold. Yeah, and I why that's not updated, whatever. But that's that's the rule. So if I spent a million dollars on a property, the IRS says, well, we divide that by 39, and that's how much of a deduction you can get for the purchase price. Well, that kind of sounds terrible. So I can go in though and say, it's not just the building. I have wiring, I have fixtures, I have carpet. And so you itemize all the different elements of the property, which then allow you to, by segregating those costs, wiring might last seven years. So then the IRS says, well, you can take that over seven years. So you're able to accelerate um, a big chunk of the property costs in year one. And if you haven't heard of this, you're like, oh man, did I miss the boat if I haven't done that? You can go do it now and like have it applied retroactively. Oh. Um, but that's kind of, that's a really big one when it comes to syndications. Like you want to make sure that they're doing that. And uh, you know, the, the sponsors that we work with, their average hold, I would say is three, five, seven years. It's definitely not 39 years. Um, so that that's, that's a big cost breakdown. Yeah, I mean, if, if I'm gonna resell it in five to seven years based on the value I created, doesn't make a lot of sense for me to, doesn't make a lot of sense for me to take the 39 years, right? Like, let's just get it all done now. Yeah, and you can do that with a single family home as well, right? But if you do it on something that's larger, uh, as somebody who's putting together syndication, now you can offer that same benefit to your passive investors because there's sort of a pass through, is that correct? Totally. Um, and in fact, the best thing about companies that specialize in cost segregation, because what happens is you actually need an engineer to go in and look at all the components of the building. Uh, they, most of them, the ones that we use, get, f get free analysis. So, I mean, we've had clients with as little as $150,000 residential real estate property go in, save 10 grand in taxes because they did a cost segregation. Cost them two, but who wouldn't put $2,000 into a vending machine to get $10,000 back out, right? That is so cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's the way to go. So I've heard that with cost segregation, there's a certain point, you know, some of the smaller properties that may not be worth it. Do you, in your knowledge, is there kind of a breaking point where it's like, do the cost segregation or maybe it's not gonna impact so much? I mean, does it always help? I have a, I have some clients who went pretty hard in like uh, some of the southern states with properties that are fifty thousand dollars or less. Okay. Um, really, it worked out great for them. I mean, the the rent they can command on that little bit of cash investment is nice, but there wasn't a ton. It wasn't worth the cost to do the cost segregation on those. But it, above that, I mean, it, it's really worth looking into because you don't necessarily know all the components that are made up in that property. And that's where the engineer comes in and they give you the free analysis. They give you a good idea. And that doesn't, I mean, if it's a free analysis, why not get the information? Okay. Yes. Yeah, I didn't know you could usually get a free analysis. So that's huge. So on the other side of that, there is recapture, right? So what is the time frame that you need to hold a property in order for the cost segregation to make sense for you long-term? Um, as long as it's more than a year, you're going to be okay because depreciation recapture is going to happen regardless. Um, yeah, so the way that works is the IRS says, hey, I'm giving you a tax break on depreciating this cost. Well, when you sell it, based on how you sell it and how the gains look, because we gave you an ordinary loss, you might have to pay an ordinary gain um, 
But with good tax professionals, you can minimize that depreciation recapture. So as an example, let's say I have $150,000 property um, and I do the cost segregation. Well, as part of that, there's furniture and fixtures. Just as an example, that's one of the things that was segregated out. Well, you could easily argue, which we do, if I'm selling that property, the buyer is paying nothing for my furniture and fixtures. Therefore, I don't allocate anything to that asset, which means I don't have any depreciation recapture on that specific item. Because it is all about what am I selling the item for that I already depreciated. Um, but yeah, it, that's kind of how it works. And uh, it's also why it's important to have a good tax professional understands those rules to help minimize that. But once you pass a year, you're in long-term capital gain status, which is better than the short term. And yeah, so if, if you're gonna make money on it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't let the potential tax consequence ruin your ability to make money on a real estate deal. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Now you're pretty publicly, um, I would say almost adversarial with the IRS. When did that show, start? Show the t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. When did that start? I guess is the first question, but also are you just that confident that you know the tax code well enough that they can't come after you or target you based on you taunting them? Yeah, I mean, ultimately if they felt like they wanted to target me, you know, we would deal with the inconvenience of the audit. And in those scenarios, but maybe they find a little bit of things, who knows. The thing is as a CPA, especially, you know, my wife would murder me while I sleep if I lost the ability to provide for the family. Um, we would never take a position that we can't defend in, with the IRS. It doesn't necessarily mean that we will win, it just means that we can defend it. Um, so that, that's one element of why we're totally fine taking the stance of being pretty aggressive, uh, at least aggressively communicating that we think they suck, because uh, they do. In addition to us, like, you know, not worrying too much in an audit scenario, the other element is we know that the training they get has nothing to do with the tax code itself. It's all about process and procedures. So when we have to actually talk to an IRS agent, most times we have to quote the tax code to them. Like, this is what the code is saying. You're saying this, but literally if you read this, it's disagreeing with you. And honestly, in most cases, we end up having to push the audits and things up to their supervisor because uh, the person who's dealing with it just isn't competent enough. Um, so yeah, I mean, it is an element of confidence that we are taking positions we believe in, that we know the tax code supports. Um, and that's really what it comes down to. You do get to this point if you've dealt with a lot of CPAs, there's a decent percentage of accountants. You kind of start feeling like they work for the IRS and not for the client. The IRS doesn't pay my bills. It doesn't do me any good to uh, you know, have the client overpaying taxes. The IRS doesn't send me a bonus for that. Yeah. Uh, and where I had the possibility if I do a really good job for my client, they might send me a bonus, you know? <laughs> They're certainly paying the invoice. So it, you get to this point where you kind of feel like, who are you actually uh, advocating for? And, and we believe that the taxpayer is the one who should be protected, not the IRS. Yeah. You had mentioned, you know, some of this comes from you were bullied early in your life. And is there maybe some examples that you can cite that makes that, that really kind of has you have that stance that the IRS is bullying most taxpayers? Yeah, so taxpayer um, had a pretty profitable business, mismanaged it. And uh, in a year they did $30 million in revenue, they declared bankruptcy. They were taxed as an S corporation, which is a specific tax status that um, most real estate syndicates aren't gonna have, but it, it's a common tax status for people who make service income. But the IRS came in after he did, declared bankruptcy and in his bankruptcy ruling came in and said, oh, by the way, we're submitting this to you. Uh, we don't have record of you being an S corporation. So we went back over the history of your company 
and you should be taxed as a C Corp, you owe us $5 million. $5 million. Wow. Um, so just some, so people understand the S Corp status. I send a form to the IRS that says, hey, tax me like an S Corp. From their system, they generate the acceptance and the letter and say, okay, we are taxing you like an S Corp. It's in their system. Well, luckily, uh, the accountant he had used years before when he set up the company had the S Corp acceptance letter on file. So he gets a copy of it, sends it to the IRS and says, hey, here's something from your system that shows you that you're basically trying to steal money from me. And $5 million went away, just with proof that he was in fact an S Corp. And they had the proof, they knew it. They, I'm convinced they send out, 80% of the letters they send out, they know are factually incorrect. They just know statistically, the majority of people pay it without thinking about it. You know, you have all taxpayers in the US as your client base. You send out a large enough amount, $500, $800, people don't think about it. It's like, oh, I'd rather just not pay that. Well, get a second opinion. But yeah, that the first one that comes to mind is that one, $5 million. They knew it. They knew that they didn't have anything, but they're just hoping the client couldn't prove it. Yeah. I think that you'd be hard pressed to find somebody who gets a letter from the internal revenue system and doesn't have like a little heart jump. I've gotten over it. What is the, you know, even if it's nothing, what has been maybe one of your biggest victories where you just thought I was able to, you know, call them out, fix it and serve my client. Um, I mean, there's a few that come to mind. So one of our victories, um, the IRS has this thing called offering compromise, which it's a kind of declaring bankruptcy with the IRS. And most people who get in that situation think they have to wait until they make money to kind of settle their tax debt. Um, client owed $600,000 in taxes, wasn't making any money. I'll shorten all the heavy details, but uh, we basically say, this is how much he can afford right now. Based on your rules, will you accept this amount as final payment and settlement? And uh, I mean, you open, you have to share that with them everything, like your bank accounts, your assets, and things like that. And yeah, so we they settled. Six hundred thousand dollars is what he did owe. He got it paid off for five hundred bucks. Yeah, that's a pretty big win. Yeah, yeah. It, wow, it's nice. So John, let's say somebody is a passive investor. They start getting some of those tax benefits and they, they kind of get the bug. They want to go out there and, and chase some additional ways of saving taxes and making money at the same time. Can you speak to some of the ideas that you've seen work well for people? Yeah, so um, I would say one of the most common next steps that a passive investor does is they buy their own rental property. Um, something small, right? The one, just the one property. Now we have to start understanding in the tax code, I either can make passive income or I can make ordinary income. Ordinary income um, has this self-employment tax tied to it. It's not great, right? And with certain tax structuring, you can minimize that. But if I create a loss with my activity that's generating the ordinary income, I'm allowed to use that to offset all my other income. If I'm a if I have passive income, I don't have self-employment tax tied to it, so that's good. But if it generates a loss, I, in many cases, most cases actually, am not allowed to take that full loss because the IRS says you can only take passive losses to the extent you have passive gains. Mm. So a real estate property is considered passive. And if you think about it, you have rental income, usually mortgage interest, property tax, and then depreciation. Those are the four things you're usually going to see on every single tax return that has a residential real estate. Well, that oftentimes can lead to a tax loss, which is awesome. But if it's passive, I may not be able to take it all right now, which means I don't get the full tax benefit of this property that's helped me grow money, but also save on taxes. Um, so you, there are things that they can do to help offset that. It could be the form of creating, um, maybe they create rental income for themselves 
outside of what their tenants are paying themselves so that they have income there because now their other business over here that they have that's getting the K-1 from the syndication, maybe it provides some services that counts as income over here. So now we've given ourselves more income, but I create an expense over here. Therefore, net effect on my tax return is I pay less in taxes. It's important that they understand whatever that bug is, whatever the next activity is, they wanna know, is this activity gonna be considered passive income or is it considered ordinary income? Because based on those two distinctions, you want a little bit of a different approach. That's why it makes sense to just talk to professionals so they know, because you know, with the 30 different things you can do with real estate, half fall under ordinary income, half fall under passive. That brings up one question that I just has, just had. You said, talk to a professional. I was thinking about those that do their own taxes because they do have W-2 income and it's just check the box, check the box. This is what I owe. Um, does somebody need a tax professional or a CPA once they start into a syndication or passive investing or can they hack that on their own? I mean, they can hack it on their own. They don't need to have someone file that tax return, um, but so like I mentioned, W-2 income tax code's pretty black and white, which is why these turbo taxes and these tax softwares are fine. But once you get into real estate, you are a business owner. The tax software can ask you, how much did you have in this expense? But they're not gonna explain to you how you actually get that expense. What types of things are you doing that qualify as travel expense? They're not gonna tell you, oh, you should be writing off your cell phone. They're just gonna say, how much telephone expense did you have? And most people are gonna be like, well, I don't have a telephone for this. Um, so uh, from my perspective, they absolutely need a professional to help them navigate all the new things that are available to them because you don't know what you don't know. Yep. And these guys aren't reading 77,000 pages of tax code, nor should they. And really that starts when they start a business, but also potentially before then, because some of your suggestions can be, go start this business and let's start offsetting some of your taxes, right? Absolutely. And when we go to that next level, you had mentioned a term earlier that I think it, it uh, is good to speak to uh, for our audience, which is becoming a real estate professional. You get some additional uh, benefits for that. Let's talk about what those benefits are and then what qualifies. Okay. And I'll just, I'll preface this with, um, if you don't end up getting real estate professional status, it's okay. It, it is better than not having real estate professional status, but it's not the end of the world. A good tax professional can help you structure things so you're still getting as much benefit as possible. So I just want to say that, because sometimes I explain this and people are like, oh man, I'm never gonna qualify for that. It's not the end of the world. Man, if you can get it, it's better. So it comes down to, Two main rules, um, and I'll talk about the third one, but it's usually a no-brainer that that qualifies. And this is, in the tax code, this is an and analysis, meaning every single one of these things have to, has to be in place. It's not an or where it's one of the three. So more than 50% of your time needs to be spent on real estate related activities. So if I have a full-time W-2 job, that means I would need to be able to document at least 2,080 hours in real estate to even have a chance, right? Now, if I'm a full-time W-2 job and my wife doesn't have a W-2 job, guess who's gonna do all the real estate activities under their name, my wife? Because now more than half her time being spent on real estate activities, that's a lot likelier. Um, the one thing, I always get this question, going to trainings, like educational things and just sitting and sitting through that, the IRS does not consider that real estate related activities. So this is all the other stuff, kind of a bummer, but. Boots on the ground, doing yeah. the work. Mm -hmm. So if I am a real estate investor, but my husband is, or if I am a real estate professional, but my husband is not, we collectively, when we do our taxes, are able to take you collectively you benefit balloon. We just need one of the persons on the tax return to to qualify. So that's rule number one that we have to look at. At least fifty percent. Well, the IRS says like, huh? Oh, that means you know the stay at home mom could work literally one hour. She don't have any other work related activities, so she'd qualify. Well, they didn't like that, so they did set a minimum number of hours, which is seven hundred and fifty. 
So if my wife isn't doing any W-2 job, she's doing real estate, we would need to be able to document that she spent 750 hours during the year on real estate related activities. As long as we can document that, which is what the IRS is gonna ask for, then we've had the two qualifications, more than 50%, at least 750 hours. The third one is material participation. Um, I mean, I've never had the IRS ever like question material participation. Because if someone, if someone has more than 50% of their time in it, and it's more than 750 hours, it kind of happens by default. But technically what that's talking about is, of that activity, did you materially participate compared to all the other people involved in that activity? Mm -hmm. So if I'm just a passive investor in a real estate syndication, I'm not technically materially participating. But now if I get the bug and I do other things, then that, that's possible. But so if I have all three of those things, now I have rep status, real estate professional status. That passive loss situation that I talked about earlier, I can take all my passive losses, no big deal. I'm allowed to do that, uh, which is, that's the biggest one. And the other one is when I sell the property and I have capital gains, back when Obamacare was introduced to the tax code, the IRS created this net investment income tax. It's kind of like you have capital gains and we're gonna tack on a little bit more so that we can, you know, redistribute wealth. Um, I don't have to pay that. If I'm a real estate professional, I at least get out of that amount on my capital gains. Uh, so those are the two main benefits of that status. But uh, I mean, that's no joke. Being able to take my passive losses, that, that'd be nice. Yeah. So that turns out, to, I, I did the math, roughly about 13 hours a week is what you have to do right. to become a real estate professional. What types of activities would I maybe be doing in my regular day life that I that, that qualify for that? It is driving around, you know? Driving to properties to look okay. at things, driving to areas to see if you want to look at properties in the area, okay. um, looking at deals, like just like sorting through, like, oh, this house is for sale, crunching numbers, those things would count. And then also if you, they are uh, real estate professional, meaning they are a licensed agent, uh -huh. does an appraiser count? Is there any designation um, within that realm that all that, counts in real estate? That, yeah, that all counts towards the tax status for sure. All right, so somebody that's uh, running a syndication, they're looking for some additional ways to offset taxes um, you know, they might qualify in this. This could be a, a, one way to do it. But let's talk about some other ways, because oftentimes somebody puts together a syndication. They're giving away the majority of that investment to their passive investors that they're raising money from. So they kind of have to get the ball ro rolling. What are some things you can think of they can do in those early years to minimize their costs that they're paying out to the IRS? So um, all the stuff they normally do because usually when a syndication buys the property, there's a level of investment that goes in the improvements and things like that. Those are all, you wanna make sure that's handled the right way, cost segregation, making sure they're classed the right way. But the reality is that's really what you're doing at that syndication entity level. Then it comes down to each individual's person. Like if I'm the one who's running the syndication, so I'm actively involved, I'm kind of the manager or whatever, I'm gonna want another entity involved and it's out of that entity that I'm gonna do a lot of other stuff. And the reason that is, is because, and I can share with you what those are, but before I do, everyone involved is gonna have a different level of these different strategies. And it's completely unfair to just have all those happen at the main level. Um, for example, if we're partners in a business and your cell phone is $2,000 a month and mine's $1,000 a month, it's a $3,000 expense on our partnership return, but really you're giving up $500 of the tax benefit that now I get just because your cell phone plan is more expensive than mine. So it's a little unfair. So that's why we say, okay, cost seg, all that stuff, great. Yeah, maximize it inside the syndication, but then let me pay for my cell phone on this other entity. Um, there's a strategy called corporate rent, uh, which I can talk about whatever you guys want, um, mileage, travel, like I'm gonna travel more than the other guy. So I don't, anyways, those are the things you do inside of this entity, which still lowers your tax income because 
income flows from the syndication to your entity to your personal return. That's why the IRS calls it pass-through, is because the tax consequence is passing through all these things and it ends, it's passed through to you as a person. And that's where all the tax consequence ends up happening. Got it. Yeah, so let's hear about okay. that uh, term that you shared. Okay. Um, what is it? What's it called? Corporate rent is what we call corporate it. Rent. Okay. Now, if people are out there and they want to Google the Augusta rule, that also is a common term for this strategy. Um, it's called, nicknamed the Augusta rule because in Georgia, once a year, these guys become obsessed with this green jacket. And so they get sticks and balls around to see who's the best person. Um, it's a PGA tour. It's called the Masters and happens in Augusta, Georgia every year. Well, it's a very wealthy area. It's a very small town though, relatively for that size of event. And so a lot of these wealthy people were like, how much are they paying for the master tickets? Okay, so these guys got money. They want some quality like place to stay. I could rent my house to them. But I don't wanna pay tax on that income. Let me pay a lobbyist to go to Washington and give me, give me a favorable tax rule on this, which is great. I love wealthy people because they do these things for us and we get to benefit from it, it's awesome. So there's this rule um, that makes a rest, like a real estate property, a real estate property. And that's this, if you rent it out for more than 14 days, by tax code definition, that means it's a, a real estate property. But people overlook the fact that if I rent something out for less than 14 days, by definition, it is not a real estate property. So if I have a house in Augusta, Georgia, and I can charge $5,000 a night, and it's about a 10 day period, I can make 50 grand, 10 days, I'm under 14. I don't have to claim that $50,000 of income anywhere because it's not a defined activity and it's specific in the tax code. Uh, That's big. Those deal. are like, I don't believe you. Section 280A G2 is the specific line that talks about this. So what happens then we say, okay, we've been talking about the investors having a separate entity, right? Now in that entity, I'm going to contract with me as a person to rent my house to the entity to have a monthly board meeting. So my business entity now takes a rent expense because it qualifies as a tax deduction. But on my personal return, I'm not required to claim any rental income or rental activity from this. And so um, we use $1,250 per day use as kind of a generic, uh, you can find enough evidence to support this in an audit. If people live in an area that's more expensive, we recommend going to a short-term rental type of website, finding a house similar in size, geographically close to where you are. If it's more than 1250, save that, and that becomes your new number. So here locally, um, there's a hotel called Grand America. Uh, we got a bunch of quotes for them for some of their smaller meeting rooms. And the quote came back at like $4,500 a day. So if you live in this area, it's so like I, I'm a little bit conservative on it. I just use $3,000 for my corporate rent expense, um, but that's $36,000 of a rent expense, which means it reduces my taxable income by 36 grand, which means it saves me about 10 to $15,000 in taxes, depending on the tax year. And if I'm an investor and I have this entity, I can take advantage of that same tax rule. And in order to qualify that your company is renting from you, do you need to invite everybody over to your house? Do you throw a party? How do you make sure that you're taking advantage of this problem? You need meeting minutes, um, but technically you could be the only one present. Uh, it, it looks better if you have rotating guests for sure. But uh, yeah, I mean, a board meeting is a thing the IRS expects you to do to treat your company like a separate entity. Because they, if you don't, they have this thing called alter ego. They file this form that says, hey, you think this is just an alter ego of you because you're not treating it like a business? Well, I'm, if I'm having a monthly board meeting, I'm treating my business like a business. Yeah. yeah. Now, if you already have the board meetings taken care of and you hear about this late in the year, can you just throw a week long party or whatever that is? <laughs> and uh, what does that look like? How do you, you know, make sure that you can take advantage of this in the proper ways? 
Yeah, as long as you can have a business purpose to why people are meeting at your house or why you need your house, you document it and that is valid. Um, you could do, well, you know, I'm gonna do a week long training at my house and I'm gonna invite some people over and totally, that could work. And it's just four, under 14 days within a year. Uh huh. Got exactly. It. So if I had an Airbnb and I was only, uh, aside from my company, if I had an Airbnb and it was rented 13 days out of the year. If it was just rented 13 times, it's exactly. not a rental activity. Therefore, all your income would be fine. Interesting. Yeah. So like secondary homes, for example, yep. people have those. And if you're not renting it out, um, you could actually do it twice. I could rent my secondary home and I can rent my primary residence. I can, I, can, I have some clients who have a weekly board meeting because they have enough partners involved that that makes sense for them. Because like, there's no rule that says you can't have, you know, 365 board meetings in a year. Yeah. And what are some of the other things? I mean, if you can't take that front loan depreciation or some of that, what are some other creative ways that people offset taxes? Um, the most common one is travel. I think people don't understand how much of a like golden nugget this is for real estate it, investors, not tax status, real estate professionals, but real estate investors. Um, the way travel works is if I sleep in a bed outside of my primary residence, the IRS considers that's a, that that's a travel day. So technically, if I have a camp out at my neighbor's house, we roast s'mores and sleep at a tent in his backyard, that's theoretically a travel day because I'm not sleeping in my house. That's step one. Next is I have to have business purpose to my travel. Well, if I'm a real estate investor, anywhere I go with land could be business purpose. Here's the thing though. I have to be able to show the IRS that I had business intention before I bought my tickets. Like that's why I'm going on my trip. Even if you're going to Florida or Southern California, you're going to Disneyland, like as long as I can show I was actually going for real estate and while I was down there, I went ahead and spent a couple of days at a theme park, you're fine. The easiest way to do that is find someone in the area. I mean, real estate agents are everywhere. Get their email send them an email, say, I'm coming to the area. I'd love to just ask you a couple questions about the area. Send it, go to your sent in inbox, print off that email you sent, because that gave you a timestamp. This is when I had business purpose. You don't even have to save if there's a response made. That's enough business purpose to justify the trip. So now, when I go to wherever I'm going, my airfare is a business expense, my hotel stays a business expense, Eating food is a business expense. Um, so many people don't realize that most of their personal travel, if they do it the right way, add a little bit of business, you're gonna be okay. Um, the last thing I should say though, more than half the days need to be business purpose related. So I can't take a two week trip and have one day that counts as a business purpose, that wouldn't work. But there's some things that help us. The day I travel to and back, those are automatically business related. If I can get Friday to have business purpose and Monday have business purpose, the whole weekend counts. So on a five day trip, it's gonna be pretty easy to have at least three of the days be business related. And there's nothing that says how long you have to be doing the business activity. You just have to document it that it happened, that you did something and, and you're fine. But that travel, it's, it's just, such a great gift to us. Such a big gift. What about entertainment on the trip? So you said you're gonna to go to Disneyland. Does that Disneyland ticket count? After 2000, tax reform of 2018, um, entertainment is no longer a tax right. expense. But the ridiculously priced food that you eat at the theme park would count as a business expense. Which tends to be more than the actual ticket. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, it definitely is. And then a lot of passive investors are utilizing retirement accounts, for example. Can you maybe speak to that as a creative strategy? Yeah, um, I call it a strategy. I don't feel like it's creative. Uh, 401ks, IRAs, they're good. So what happens is I can put money into it and depending on whether it's a Roth IRA or a traditional IRA or a Roth 401k, 
traditionals allow me to take a tax deduction now when I put the money in, but then I pay tax later when I pull it out. Roths allow me to use what they call after-tax dollars, so I don't get a break now, but all the growth that happens inside and any distribution I take out later in life isn't taxed. Um, so it's there. It, certainly, if you have the extra cash flow, go for it. I would say for real estate investors, like most of the time people are just investing in a 401k, someone else is managing it. If you're a real estate investor and you caught the bug, do a self-directed. Take that control because then the money I got the deduction for in the first place or I, that I put in that's gonna grow tax-free, so I can use that 401k retirement account or my IRA retirement account and it can do the investment for me. And now all the gain that it gets, if it's the Roth, I won't have to pay tax on it. Most common, famous example that really ticked off the IRS is uh, the guy who created PayPal bought his stock inside of his self-directed IRA. And when he sold it, he has billions of dollars of gain that the IRS cannot tax him on. Mm. Like, the strategy works. Speaking of not taxing, I feel like we need to at least dip into the pool of 1031 exchange. If somebody didn't know, a lot of, I know people that have heard of it, but they don't really know what the, what the regulations are. Can you kind of give us some of the, some of the basics on that? Yeah. So the reason someone would want to do that is it allows them to take what they would have paid tax on their capital gain and effectively move that into a new property. So there are specific rules around it. You want to make sure you get the timings right. Um, you have a certain window, it's 45 days or 60 days, to have a property identified and you have a certain amount of time to close on the new property. Um, and you're not allowed to touch the money. So you usually use an intermediary. Lots of title companies have this service, uh, so it's not hard to find one. But the idea is, so I have property A, I'm selling it, I want to do a 1031. And the 1031 just described, that's just the number of the tax code section. That's why it's called that. Okay. Nothing fancy. Right. And I, like, well, I don't want to pay capital gains on this. Like, I, I'm going to turn around and invest it in real estate again anyways. Like, okay, just do it kind of all in the same window. So I have property A, I know I'm going to sell it. I need to have some properties that I'm looking at. Or in most cases that I've seen with our clients, instead of having an option of properties and then they later can close on it, most of them already have the one property. They're getting under contract. The contract kind of stipulates, I'll close, like connects in succession to this happening. Um, so then you sell it, the money that would have gone to you goes to the intermediary business, usually a title company. They then take that money and send it to the seller of the new property that you just bought. So it doesn't touch your hands. And now what you've done is you've taken your capital gain and now it's sitting in this property. I mean, I, I had a client, I think she did six in a row. I mean, not in a row, but over the course of like 20 years, she had taken gain and like passed it on six times. Uh, that was pretty cool. Uh, cause That's cool. You don't, it's, it's a tax deferral method, which is still better than paying the tax now, right? Because in this case, property A, if I end up just taking the gain, I pay the tax on it, and then I go to property B, maybe I'm not able to get the same size of house or same type of investment because I had to give up some of my money in taxes. So I can take that, and instead of getting into the IRS, I have now put it immediately back to work. So kind of a velocity of money concept. Bro growth strategy. Yeah. And I know that the property has to be like for like, right? Like property. What about passive investing? Can you do a 1031 as a passive investor? And does it just have to go into another passive investment? It doesn't have to be the same type of property. How does that work? So like on like is pretty general. Like I could actually sell a property and put that into land and the IRS is going to say that's like for like, as long as my intention is that this is going to be some sort of real estate related activity. Um, so I can go from a passive investment to investing in an active investment. I could go from an active investment and putting it into a passive investment. Um, I would be surprised if the syndications you deal with don't have a process in place anyways, where it's like, oh, you're selling this? Yeah, Dr. Amy here. 
we'll take the proceeds and then you can put it into this fund here. Uh, so yeah, it, it's more flexible than people think. Okay. But it certainly can be like, I sold this property, now I'm buying a business. That definitely doesn't right. work. Yeah. Now we talked about the difference there is your tax deferral versus like a self-directed retirement account, which is tax exempt, right? Mm -hmm. On the gain. Yep. So let's say your client, for example, or in theory, they've passed that on. And at a certain point, they can no longer pass that on. What are the, what are the tax consequences look like at that point? You just end up paying the capital gains at that point. So it's the same amount they would have paid. They just now, depending on how many properties they've passed along. So what we're looking at, the IRS has this term called basis, which is your purchase price, improvements put into it. Your basis is what reduces how much capital gains you have. So if I bought a property for 100 grand, sell it for 150, not taking into consideration depreciation, or not taking into consideration depreciation or anything complicated, you'd have a $50,000 capital gain. I wouldn't have a $150,000 capital gain. So I only have to pay capital gains on the $50,000 in that example. But let's say I didn't, I 1031'd it, and now I'm in a property that's 300,000. My basis is still the basis from the first property. That's why I'm kicking the can down the road. And then if I did it again, so the 50 now automatically becomes gain over here, the more I do it. And then once I get out of it, I will pay the tax at that point. But again, there are other options out there like um, qualified opportunity zones. Um, There's some companies out there that are syndications actually that specialize in opportunity zone investing. Um, there's things like Delaware trusts that are set up in a way that they're actually kind of 1031 trusts. And so you can put the money in that and then the syndication basically manages the money and moves it around to the different properties. So you're getting the benefit of the 1031 without you having to deal with the headache of doing it yourself. Like it, there are a lot of great opportunities out there for people who are looking to just continue to revolve their money around in the real estate world. Well, so you brought up an interesting one. If you're going on down the road and then you, let's say it's your fourth 1031, you 1031 into an opportunity zone, can you essentially offset all of your gains with the benefits of that opportunity zone? Well, unfortunately, opportunity zones haven't been around long enough for someone to do that yet. Because uh, the benefits of the opportunity zone is the longer I keep it there, the more of the gain the IRS lets me not worry about up to all of it being not taxed. Um, my guess is they're going to have you pay some capital gains, but there is a chance that you can uh, file, file it in a way that maybe you're able to offset the entire gain if you held that opportunity zone long enough. Like the, those rules are a little bit untested right now with, with court rulings and things. Got it. Makes sense. Well, John, is there anything else that you would want to share with our audience and the people that are out there looking to save taxes? I just don't believe any letter you get from the IRS. Always get a second opinion because chances are you don't owe them as much as they're telling you that they owe you. Such a comforting thought. Just yeah. <laughs> go, to, yeah. go to your tax pro. John, if, if, thank you for spending your time and literally your hard won wisdom. Um, if people want to know about your firm um, or, or talk to you, how do they do that? Um, so our website is insightstax.com and it isn't spelled differently. It's I-N-C-I-T-E-T-A-X because it's common uses to incite a riot. It technically just means cause to action. We believe in being proactive. So go to the website. Um, we have a ton of blogs, a bunch of free information on these strategies. We can get into paying kids. So if you have kids, you can do that within these entity structuring. Like there's all sorts of options. And in most cases, we've already shared it for free on our blog. So check us out there. That, that's the best place. Very cool. Perfect. John, thank you for joining us. And thank you everybody for joining us for another episode of the Fundication Show. Mm -hmm.